Well, I'm Jim Mason, and um, I was actually never supposed to do this. I was trained as an anthropologist um, a philosophy major. I um, actually went to school to do mechanical engineering and got bored um, and wandered off in humanities and social sciences and have found myself back in the, in the thick of mechanical engineering, um, which my, my youth was mechanical engineering. I, uh, my dad had a shop, took me out of the shop at a young age, um, taught me all the machines, spin a or misspin a youth, um, racing various sorts of uh, wheeled vehicles and scarring the earth in Southern California out in the desert. Um, and gasification has somehow been a, um, a logical destination for that uh, odd collection of, of um, earlier experiences. So, um, our path into gasification is, is a somewhat unusual one. Um, this facility here started as the shipyard. Uh, it was an art space that was developed for people uh, doing large scale mechanical and kinetic art. There's a lot of, kind of art tech collaboration that goes on in the Bay Area. Um, uh, um, large, large scale building, a lot of us around the, the, the Burning Man Festival in Nevada. And we built a facility to support um, people doing uh, fabrication and creative work around that. Um, we built it as a, as a, we started in the far end of, the, of, of this facility in a, essentially a parking lot. Uh, we brought in a bunch of shipping containers as essentially free buildings, um, free made volume, and started working with shipping containers as kind of architectural Legos. We set up shops and studios. We made like a perimeter out of them stacked too high with a um, nice open space in the middle for collaboration. Um, tried to come up with some model that wasn't fully a, a hippie co-op where everyone's in everyone else's stuff and it becomes a um, you know, political disaster. Nor did we try to have a completely cell phone shop where everyone's having to you know, rent large amounts of space to do their project. We tried to do like a mix. Everyone had a shipping container and then had this big open area. And we were very excited about this. We thought this was a nice model to enable this work without a lot of money. Um, and we could leverage all of the structural certifications and whatnot in the shipping container. Um, Berkeley didn't agree with that interpretation. And we ended up in a, in a pitched battle over what we were allowed to do in terms of innovative work in the built environment. Um, their answer was zero, basically. Um, and they're opening, opening volley in response to our, um, our creative efforts was to shut off the power, um, which we didn't like that, and we thought that was unfair. So for the next seven years, um, we battled them legally and politically and in the media to try to, um, to um, come to some, some solution where we could, we could pursue this kind of architectural reuse scenario. Um, and try to get it to work through code. Um, and in the interim, we had to make power. So what started as an arts facility very quickly became this rather significant um, experiment in power generation and conversion, okay? Um, and it wasn't to like run an a, a, um, a cabin out in the woods. It was to run you know, 10, 15 horsepower lathes and mills, um, multiple welders, grinders, um, large metal halide lights to fill the whole yard. So we had to put together um, an industrial scale off-grid system. Uh, we built a shipping container called the power tainer that was the you know, central pool for this. Um, we, we found a, a, an old battery array out of a telecom switching station, a 17,000 pound battery array, 48 volts, um, 5,000 ampere hour uh, capacity. It's absolutely gigantic. It's all clear sides. You could do the chemistry and like watch the stuff going on. It's like 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 doing chemistry for your pool. Um, we had uh, 33 kW of inverters. Um, we used the trace Antrex inverters and hacked them, um, um, stacked them on, on each leg, hacked the timing signal so we could get them to three phase. So we could run all of our industrial tools. Is it trace Antrex won't let you inside your, their, their machines, um, but some of the local hardware geniuses. Um, um, made some modifications. So we, um, we ended up with the self-contained container that had the batteries and inverters, so um, it, it could start any piece of equipment in the yard. It was fully automated, so it'd start a generator. Um, if that load continued, it was all online. So I was working in San Francisco. We could um, uh, control, uh, monitor and control the whole system online. Um, actually, the first machine that I know that ever sent me a, an email was my generator over here. It was a mailing list for the generator, so every time the generator would do everything, make a little note. So we made 
we made the pool and the delivery, and then we started, well, how do we actually fill this with power? So, um, you know, we, we had a biodiesel plant here. We were making biodiesel in a shipping container, um, running a generator for most of our power. Um, we, of course, did the obvious thing, set out into to PV and installed a variety of PV around the facility. Um, that met with the usual frustrations of, of economics and um, the reality of what you get for the, the effort and money investments. Um, and so it started wandering further afield. And in that process, I, I discovered a gasification from Tom Miles' gasification list. I was actually looking for good online discussion around um, exotic heat engine cycles and the best, the best engine discussion was going on on the gasification list. So I ended up there talking about engines and ultimately got, got um, excited or curious what this gasification thing was. So um, nine years later, um, we're now running a startup around um, all forms of uh, biomass thermal conversion. But that originally started out of this very curious um, um, origin in the arts world. Okay, So, um, the art part still exists on the far part of the yard. We've slowly expanded down in these two buildings here. Um, we, you know, the original interests here were, were engineering, how do, we, how do we solve the long-standing fuel sensitivity and tar issues and gasification. We did a, you know, a lot of work on that starting five years ago, got some interesting things, um, started the usual patenting process and quickly realized that the problem here, there isn't, this isn't just a technical problem. Um, there's equally manufacturing issues. How do you actually realize these, these, these objects or the, these designs in some, in some manner that is economically reasonable, um, that they can be made in some, with something less than a you know, massive um, cap, capital injection up front to make them on a you know, large scale. Um, how do you get, how do you reestablish the information for running these? How do you get people interested in them? So we really ended up in this whole experiment around how to make these things and how to kind of propagate the knowledge and conversation. So what we thought was an engineering project became kind of a physical realization project, which is all what's going on here in the shop. And then all of the online effort about how do you orchestrate the conversation around these such that we might be able to, to um, cast up a, a hacking culture around this, um, a DIY culture like we have, have had in all of the computing world. So I mean, we are very self-consciously trying to run um, the same sort of arc that started with the Solder Together Heath kits and the early Solder Together PCs and the Homebrew Computer Club and you know, similarly trying to get rich tools into the hands of the, peop the people that are going to be interested in engaging this in the very early stages of it. So we purposely deliver very open machinery, things that you know, it requires your participation. It's not a black box that you press a button and magic things happen inside of it. Um, it is you know, machinery that rewards close inspection and partic participation with the, the particulars. Okay? So that's the general background. So I want to very quickly do an introduction to um, what we're going to do this weekend, and most specifically, um, the gasification technology behind it. Um, the goal in the, in the weekend is to do a combination, rather unusual combination, of information, um, hands-on learning and running, and active participation in various sorts of research projects, whether um, let's generate some knowledge or let's build something and figure out how to realize some idea with actual machines that are accessible. Okay. Um, we're about at the, the, the far, farthest opposite end you can be of a, um, an immaculate press release that says we just discovered the silver, silver bullet in the lab and in 15 years this magic thing's going to exist and all of our problems are going to uh, disappear and as we... So it's, at some point I'm going to... I would like to develop this his, kind of a historic documentation of all of the, the immaculate inventions that in... 10 to 20 years in the energy world are going to solve our problems. The road between that thing that works interestingly in the lab and what can actually be meaningful out in the world is gigantic. Uh, it's been sober. So we try to work in all this other space over here. Um, we're really trying to take or um, well, well expose and elaborate the raw science. 
um, be realistic about what it takes to move these things out in the world, and tr try to transact that space with the minimum cost and material complexity as possible. Okay, um, we're trying to do all of this with um, to solutions that don't require um, artificialities in the form of government subsidies or exotic financing, things that have a raw price calculus um, on the fundamentals. What's exciting about gasification, I think, in the end is um, it's some exotically configured steel tanks. There's, there's nothing here that should be terribly expensive. The knowledge is expensive, um, but that goes away over, over time, particularly if you want to give it away. Um, the, you know, the small scale and volume is kind of somewhat expensive in the beginning, but it's not like trying to make, make a, a, um, a, a, a silicon chip manufacturing um, endeavor for ma making PV panels. It's a completely other scale of activity. So we see that there's a lot of opportunities here for distributed manufacturing and distributed deployment of this in a, in a very parallel way to which we like this as a distributed energy scenario. Um, I, I, I do actually think this, have, this technology has some very interesting um, potentials for um, increasing self-determination and individual liberties um, because it, 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 it scales down well to the individual. We've already completely distributed the fuel that relates to this energy scenario around the world um, thanks to photosynthesis and this is a technology that allows you to, to work with that already existing fuel all over the world. Um, convert it into a form that it will work with the similarly already existing um, internal combustion engines that are already all over the world. Um, and so it has this potential to work with existing infrastructure and to do that at you know, the scale of the individual or small business. It doesn't have to be a broadcast model as um, has been typical in our energy industry. Okay? So, um, we're, we work in, the, in that space of implementation, and we try to be very on, honest about that. So, we're going to get very dirty this weekend. Um, we're going to enjoy the pleasures of black goo. There's lots of black goo in biomass thermal conversion. You learn to love it. Um, it smells and feels and probably doesn't taste, but at least smells and feels better than, than um, um, nasty vegetable oil. So, it, 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 it is more pleasant than, than recovering um, grease out of the back of McDonald's. Um, Though it is harder to convert it into something that can be usable for, for the engine, so we're making it much easier. Um, so we have uh, four different tracks. Um, the power pellet track, which is the continuing work on how to get this, how, how to uh, integrate the, the a variety of, of engineering work. Excuse me, sorry. Um, the power power track is, is the continuation of this project to how can we create a small, compact form factor, highly integrated, highly automated system that makes running um, a gasification solution um, to power of various forms a reasonable proposition for somewhat regular people. Okay? So and there's, we keep taking steps and steps down this process. We now have it to a form that, that um, um, is ready to run for um, the next week, and we're going to be stepping to that over the week. We've just changed the engine out. We've been going through a long process of trying out and assessing various engine and gen head combinations, and all of the automation to integrate the engine and the gen head, or excuse me, the engine and the gasifier. So we've just changed out to this Kubota engine, which we're, we're very excited about. It's a significant step above the, the, the Kohler. And we, as you see, we're just, we're finishing putting it together right now. We have a variety of configuration work still on that. And then all of the instrumentation around it is a rather significant project. So tomorrow is going to be running it and proving all of the instrumentation equipment, really getting the whole um, test bed together so that we can run, run it and generate meaningful data um, over, over a, long, uh, a longer term. Most of our running or our, our data logging today has been about very specific reactor conditions for characterizing performance in the reactor to understand um, tar issues. We we generated that knowledge. We're a little less interested in that now. We're now we really want to um, look at the fuel weight to power output and other 